Um, he's throwing shade at you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can resist. all right everyone welcome back it's good to see you all i saw a lot of you on saturday morning hopefully it wasn't too painful there were donuts if you didn't come um we are we're just about done uh, so a reminder we have class today thursday we will not meet but i am asking you to please take those 90 minutes and complete uh the fall 2018 exam part two take that you can do it in this room if you want you can do it at home i don't care i will not be here but i'm giving you 90 minutes so you can't complain not having the time that, that's okay so i didn't have time to do it okay you're giving you 90 minutes that's yours to keep do it as you wish yes i'm sorry fall 2018 part two uh brie has a langdell session when she'll do part one ah so she'll go over part one for an exam i'll go over part two so there's your marching orders right there's no reading in class for thursday so between now and thursday try to take time to at least do part one and part two so brie will review part one on the langdell session saturday and then i will review part two um uh, in class on tuesday and that's all folks uh that's it uh after that you're on your own i mean I, that's not what i mean but there are no more classes um uh someone asked me about a cutoff for questions and i think i said the fourth at 6 p.m i think that's what i said at the so that's that's a deadline yeah i know they they changed the time i have no control over that i'm sorry for the confusion so it's 4 p.m the cutoff still at 6 p.m. I will not change my deadlines. It's so arbitrary. But my deadline for questions, if you want, will be May 4th at 6 p.m. I don't promise it'll answer your question if you get by the deadline. The reason why is that some questions are easy to answer, um, others aren't. You know, but the question like, you know, I don't get covenants, you know, I uh, pray, right? Uh, no, I, I don't I don't mean it to be mean, but like I sometimes the questions I get before the exams are just panic, like, oh my God. I don't know what's going on. Blackman download in my brain, right? It, it it doesn't work like that. I once had one year a student actually text me. I don't know, I got my, my my business card was on my desk. They found my cell phone number. It's not anymore. Um, I said no. I replied with the email. You do not text. I know some professors like students texting them. I I I, I cannot bear that. That's just way too much. Uh, but it was a panicking text. Like, can I call you for questions? I'm like, oh man. Um, so again, if you want to email me in advance, you can. 
Uh, if there's something that you know isn't the best thing to resolve over email, I might say you want to go and Zoom for a few minutes. We can do that. Um, but really, at this point, I'm giving you the resources you need uh, to sort of prepare. If there's like last minute things, I'm happy to answer it. But I, to be completely candid, I find the emails the week before the exam are not always the most cogent emails because you're all sleep deprived and stressed, and it's it's not the best. Is that a hand? You seem you want to ask a question. And that's barely class. It's reviewing the exam. So there's actually no more readings. In fact, today, Cedar Point is your last case with me. Is that sad? I know. So sad. I, I know you're just heartbroken. You're like, oh, thank God. I'm almost done with this. Um, oh, I know. It's fine. Uh, there'll be a new crop of kids in the spring, and they'll have the same same anxieties and same problems. So it's just, just, just it's a weird thing, this job. Our lives just repeat. It's just like the cycle, right? We go through about 14 weeks, and we have a new crop of kids, and we do the exact same thing over again. It's a very... Like you graduated, I've never graduated law school, right? I just, I perpetually have been in law school since I was a one out. I'm only slightly exaggerating. Um, I, I basically clerked for three years, I was teaching during those years, so I never actually left law school. All right, so questions on the schedule for our semester the last couple of days. Again, no, no class here Thursday, I will not be here. If you want to call me, you can, but I won't pick up. No, I, I, I'll answer emails, just don't call, don't, don't text me. Hello. Uh, I know the professors actually will like Snapchat their kids and like I just you're just I'm serious and they're just asking for a Title IX violation. They're just they're just asking for it at this point. It's just oh boy, uh, yeah, no bad idea. Um, what else? Um, yeah. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to re I'll, we'll get to the Cedar Point case uh, in a little bit, but I want to review to the start Hakings doctrine, and I think what makes this topic sort of different is that it's very case driven and not just like independent cases like Howard v. Kunto or you know Pierce v. Post. These are cases that build upon each other, right? We're talking about a hundred years of Supreme Court doctrine that doesn't follow a straight path. So at least if you're taking con law, you know this is par for the course, but this is property. You have to sort of remember this is a con law-ish topic. So I'm going to just put a name of the case on the board and go around the room and we'll go through all the cases, see how this goes. All right, where, who's next? Jacob, tell me I've had a check, please. Oh, that was uh, the, the harmful ocean. What are the facts there? Just just briefly. Just, oh, that's where they do uh, the bridge where you can't. Uh, there was uh, this like regulation that you can't. The, what do you do to bricks? Oh, oh, uh, mold, no, burn them. Bake them, fine. Bake, bake them, good. Yeah. Okay. And why couldn't they bake the bricks? Why was that act prohibited? Uh, because there was a uh, noxious use. Correct. Right. If you actually read how to check, these were nuisance. But in the modern lingo, we say it's a harmful, noxious use. All right. Yeah, go ahead, Jacob. And then what is it be? It's common law? Correct. Oh, good, good, good. See, see, I like what we did. He's tying together different doctrines, right? In theory, at least, the baking brick was a common law nuisance. That's at least how Lucas described it. Uh, I don't know that baking brick was a common law nuisance. There was no noise or smoke or anything, but in theory, at least, it could be. Okay, and what was the test they gave in the, in the Hattach case, Jacob? Uh, that was uh, no company code. So, uh, yeah, it was. Ben? Um, so there's no compensation to get police power? Correct. This is a police power case, right? When the government is prohibiting a harmful, noxious use, a common law nuisance, there's no requirement to police power. And you must always remember that. And any sort of question that I can give you, always sort of double up and make sure, is this a sort of common law nuisance? You say, Josh, I don't know what a common law nuisance is. And don't worry, you're not alone, right? But at least you can make an argument based on the facts. If there's noise, if there's smoke, if there's pollution, Things that in torts would sort of say, okay, oh, yeah, that's a nuisance, right? You have some some grounding in this. All right. All right. Uh, let's stay with stay with uh, Ben for a moment. Ben, I, I say pen coal. What's going on there? Um, that's the case with the, the, the coal mine, and there mm -hmm. was a law that I think prohibited like the digging of coal on a residency. Under under the residency. Under, under, yeah. that, that, that's right. That's right. Okay. Um, and I think. The court ruled that because it like completely like devalued 
the, the land that it was too far land to Okay, so you said a few things that are good. One, you said too far, and that's the test that Justice Holmes made up in the uh, Penn Cole case. If you notice, in the case today, it's all about did it go too far? They kept using that phrase. Even 100 years later, it's saying, does it go too far? And perhaps the reason why the Cole statute went too far was that it was a complete diminution in value. Maybe. Was it? You saw other value for the land. You have the surface rights. But at least in Penn Cole, Justice Holmes focused entirely on the 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 the, the the subsurface rights underneath the house. And then Wafa, just help us out here. What was the Brandeis dissent in Penkel, which proves to be extremely influential? The Justice James Rice wrote that um, this could be the value of the property. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ben? Uh, look at the parcel. I'll come back to you. Parcel as a whole, what does that mean? Parcel. Take, like, you have to look at the entire property and look at the value. Right. Just as Brandeis explained that you can focus entirely on the subsurface rights. You have to look at the value of, this, of, the, of the entirety, not just what's restricted, but all their land. This would prove to be influential. You saw it in Penn Central. We'll get to that in a minute, right? You've seen it in Lucas. You've seen it in Tahoe Sierra. What is our denominator, right? And I know you guys don't like math. That's why you went to law school. But when I say denominator, all I mean is, what is the entirety of the property we're thinking about? If there's a little tiny regulation on, say, one acre of land, and you want 1,000 acres, well, what's the big deal? You have 999 acres left, right? What is the relevant denominator? What are you dividing by? So Justice Brandeis will come in. On the question, you need to think about what is the relevant property being regulated versus how much the person owns. Those are not always the same thing. Okay? I'm sure. Um, you have to think about what is being regulated and what's the entirety of the property that's owned, right? How much does the person own versus what's actually being regulated upon? Those are not always the same thing. Um, sometimes the government regulates on everything. Other times they regulate on a lot of things. Sometimes they regulate on nothing at all. Did I answer your question? I don't actually remember what I say. It was, oh man, what did I say? Hopefully I got it right. People were type, type, typing. By the way, you guys know I put the auto transcripts up, right? You see the links? Good. I put them in the class notes after class. I obviously can't do it before because I haven't taught the class yet. But I always put the outer links. So if there's a, a, a phrase or word that I didn't use that you didn't understand, you can always back and check it. Um, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, I know it's creepy when I do this, but, you know, but um, what do you call it? Uh, it's, it's, it's in real time. You could even just, you know, yeah, where is it? So. right here but as i speak the words will magically appear right on the screen who needs a professor she can just chat gpt the class and i i, I i've actually thought about it. if i just put all my lectures over the years since like chat gpt you could just like clone me that would be scary clone my voice it's actually easy you can clone a voice but put a deep fake all my youtube videos you know i'm missing it's just like i totally fake a class okay see i can fake a class not take a class Bad, bad computer. All right. See, not perfect yet. All right. Next case that I want to put on your roster is Penn Central. I'll go back to Wafa for this one, please. When I say Penn Central, what's what's going on there? You're giving me something that's correct, but wasn't actually established in Penn Central. What was the actual test they put forward in Penn Central itself? You, you, you said it was correct, but that's not what the Penn Central court said. That's true, Hillary. That's what I'm looking for. Tell me about that. Yes, they made the the airspace so expensive, but all the money they get from the structure itself and stuff, and like the parcel as a whole. Test yes. Like, yes, very like, good. It's still like they still were making so much money, and they looked at like their adjacent properties. Correct. Excellent. Excellent. Right. 
So there were a couple insights from the Penn Central case, right? When you're thinking of the air rights on top of the train station, you can't just focus on those air rights alone. The company, Penn Central, owned a lot of real estate, both in that building and in adjacent properties. You also have these credits where you can, in theory, turn your lamp off. It's, a, it's dark. But... Anyway, so in theory, at least, they could transfer these credits to adjacent properties, which would provide even more revenue. So the inside of Penn Central is the parcel as a whole is everything that this company owns. And not just everything they own, all the adjacent properties that could receive these, these transfer credits. Okay. The Penn Central Court also put together some factors to think about. Um, Alejandro, what's some of the factors that, that would come to be known as the Penn Central test or Penn Central factors? That's one of them. Economic impact. What else? The character of the taking. Okay, what else? Yeah, the last one is the most important one, the distinct investment-backed expectations, right? This is what you call an ad hoc balancing test, where none of these three factors is actually dispositive. You can look at one, look at two, look at three. They all balance together, right, in sort of indeterminate ways. But the important one's the last one. In other words, if you just have a plan that you want to build in the future, and you haven't really put any money behind your plan, you haven't really suffered a loss, right? You don't suffer a loss until you actually have some sort of reliance. Estoppel, if you will, can give in terms of a, of, of a contract dispute. Have you relied on some sort of process or some sort of permit to actually go ahead and construct something? If you haven't, you're not going to win, right? And if you notice in every single case, the government said, we want Penn Central. And every case after this, the property owner said, no, no, we don't want Penn Central. In fact, in every case said, we concede we lose under Penn Central. Did you notice that? You saw it in Lucas? Right, you saw it in the um, in, in the Coons case. You saw it today in Cedar Point. They said we'll concede we lose under Penn Central because it's a test design for the government. The government wins it almost every time, right? And it, there are narrow exceptions. They're very narrow where the government loses. But all the discussion to apply Penn Central, to apply balancing, what that means is the government will lose, right? Uh, Penn Central also is very clear that there are no bright line rules for property takings, right? There's no bright line rules for what a regulatory taking is. We use a very flexible ad hoc test. And the thinking was, we live in a very crowded world. And we can't go on as a society if the government has to pay every time they impose some sort of regulation on property. Right? That was what Justice Holmes said 100 years ago. And that was repeated in the Penn Central case. OK. Yes, uh, Caitlin. No, I, did I say that? I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. No, the government wins. Okay, I thought the property owner lost. Yeah, property owner loses. I'm sorry if I misspoke. I apologize. No, no, no. You, you, you no. Call me out. Call me out. Look, I even maybe this is a chat GPT, but you just don't know it yet. Um, I mean, I think if we were still on Zoom, I could do a deep fake with cloning, and you probably wouldn't even know. I could probably pull up a class, and it would be like, oh, well, Blackman's not on his game today, but it'd be like passable. I'm thinking, thinking about it. Okay. All right. Good Penn Central. Oh, I'm sorry. Unless you've broken ground. I mean, look, I'm, I, I tried to sort of grossly oversimplify, but in that case, didn't they buy all those architectural blueprints and designs and they applied for this permitting litigation? That was not sufficient. Right? We're, 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 we're the. Um, where the Dibby test really comes in is where you have something that's pre-existing and the government says stop using it. That's really where you have you have serious expectations that are backed up by investments. That that's that's where you might actually win in the Dibby test. If you think of the amortization principle from the um uh, the Moon Township, that's where the adult bookstore. That's that's the idea, right? That wasn't a case under the federal constitution, but you have this business, it's been in existence, right, for ever much time, and you're saying stop it. Right. So even under that case, you might actually went under Penn Central. Right. This is why with Lucas, they said you can't build anything ever forever. Right. There, there was at least a permanent deprivation. But the amortizations, you have an existing property, you want to wind it down, that might be a taking. Okay. Make sense? Loretto. Let's talk about Loretto. Good. Yeah. Uh, so 
uh, that's where New York City requires um, that all the buildings are tabled on them or buildings are tabled on them. And the court, for the first time, they have a bright line categorical rule. Bright line categorical rule, yeah. When does that rule kick in? When there are permanent physical, when there is a permanent physical occupation. Magic words. Permanent physical occupation, right? Why, why is that a regulatory taking? Why is that categorical? Uh, because the court would care that as soon as that happens, that's an automatic taking. We care about how much damage there is. Yeah. Do we care about how intrusive the occupation is? Do we care about how strong the public interest is? Yeah. None of that matters. Right. Thank you. Very good. Now, I want to just focus on the words that she mentioned a moment ago. Permanent physical occupation. Permanent. And I thought, teaching property for many years, that the word permanent was very important. We read today in the, in the um, Cedar Point case that apparently the duration is not very important. Because, you know, they were not... The, the labor organizers were not there 24-7. They were there for a couple hours a day for, you know, a, a four-month, a three-month window, four-month window, right? So just keep that point in mind. What did Loretto say with regard to permanence? And how does the Cedar Point majority apply Loretto? Okay, then think of the raisin case, right? Were those raisins going to be permanently occupied? Yeah, yeah, they're going to be taken and sold or destroyed, whatever else they're going to do. But Cedar Point, the permanence issue gets a little bit tricky. All right, and we go with Loretto. All right, uh, the next case I want to do is Lucas. Uh, I think, Fernando, I think you're next. Can you just talk us about Lucas for a minute, please? Well, that's, that's, that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm doing this very deliberately. If you don't remember these cases, you're in trouble for the taking question. Um, because I, I always ask at least one takings question. I mean, just go through my old exams. There's only at least one. And unfortunately, now you have Cedar Point. That case wasn't there last time, so now you got a new case to learn. Do you have it or no? I'll come back to you. Duke, tell us about Lucas. Through this house, you have two. I guess you bought an extra lot. Mm -hmm. In order to get the uh, permit, you have to. Uh, we had to submit to get the permit to do it. And they said, well, they put some conditions on it that he thought were too stringent. So he. Could he build it all? No. No, this is not just condition. This is a moratorium, flat out. So um, there was no balance in test. And uh, they said that the. Uh, This is Judge Julius. One of his decisions. Okay, so this was the um, what he said was a common law nuisance, but you can't impose new restrictions without compensation. In other words, you can't. You can't since you already own the property. You can't say, okay, now you have to do this to the field. I think I think I got most of what you said. Let me just ask you a follow up question, if I can, please. Um, was this a Categorical taking, or is this a case where the court followed the Penn Central balancing framework? He bypassed the Penn Central. He bypassed it, and why did he bypass it? <coughs> because the all the economic risk that was wiped out. Ah, good. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is a case where the court said, "Well, we usually." We usually apply Penn Central, but we will not apply it here. And the reason why is there's been a complete diminution in value, 100%. All the economic value is wiped out by this moratorium. Therefore, we do not follow Penn Central. Instead, we apply a categorical test, which means there is a taking unless the government is prohibiting some harmful, noxious use. And that harmful and noxious use must be defined by the common law. It cannot be a newly decreed harmful use. Okay. So again, Lucas focused on a regulation of the property that diminishes all economic value. All economic value. So we can just jump at the Cedar Point for a minute. Was the Cedar Point regulation depriving of all economic value? No. 
No, he, I mean, yes, you had these workers coming on your, I mean, these, these organizers coming on your farm for some period of time. He still were productive. He still had economic value. So Lucas doesn't really apply to the, um, the Cedar Point case. Um, does Lucas apply to the Raisin case? In other words, were the raisins deprived of all economic value? Well, you might say yes, right? The raisins that were seized, all the value was taken. What about the raisins they kept? Right, they kept all the other raisins. So it's not clear that Lucas would be the relevant framework for the raisin case either. You see what I'm doing here, right? I'm trying to apply these various cases to different fact patterns. They may not fit neatly, which is exactly what we ask you to do, right? I won't. I promise you this much. I will not say, under the Lucas test, is there a taking? No, that'd be way too easy. Right? I'm not going to be that nice to you. Right? You don't want me to be that nice. You really don't. Um, I will give you a very intricate fact pattern, and you have to figure out which precedent governs. And That's right. The reason why they didn't follow Lucas was they found there was a per se categorical taking under Loretto. Right? That was a holding in Loretto. I'm sorry, in Horn, because they seized the raisins and said the seizure of the raisins was no different than installing the wires on the side of the building in, the, in, in New York City. But why am I making such a big deal? You have to know the facts of these cases. Why? Because you see, oh, these facts are similar to Loretto, and oh, those facts are different than Horn. And even within Horn, they say, we're not applying this test because of X, Y, and Z, right? This is like this, imagine like a puzzle, like a, or a Jenga board, right? Well, these pieces are kind of stacked on top of each other. You have to know which piece to pull out without making the entire thing topple. Duke? So like, with this, this case in, in, um, Cedar. Cedar Point, yeah, nursery. Potentially could uh, argue uh, the bank Penn Central starts. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll, we'll, I promise we'll get to that point, my friend. And this case shakes everything up, and that's why I'm doing it last. Very, very... I want I want to present the law as it existed in 2020, and then we'll get to the 2021 case. Is that cool? Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, I'll just sort of cut to the chase. <laughs> I wrote this post the day that Cedar Point was decided. You'll I don't know maybe you'll like it or not. I don't know. So I wrote this. It was June 25th, 2021. Cedar Point Nursery quietly reloaded four decades of takings clause doctrine. You're welcome. I wrote that the day the case came out, so I had some time to think about it since. All right, that's Lucas. Johnny, Tahoe Sierra, please. What's 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 that about? Um, so uh, there was a point in the agency where uh, they were trying to develop uh, in California, as it like Tahoe, and they were worried that it could contaminate the water and make it. Good. Yeah, not so blue. Yeah. Okay. And what was the analysis? What was the outcome of that case, please? Did, did 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 the Tahoe court say this follows natural from Lucas? Um, no. no, why not? Um, because, uh, a sale? Sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? Alex? Um, because it was only temporary, it was like a couple of years of moratoria rather than like a permanent one. Like Correct. Permanent. Correct. Right. Um, I'll come back to sale. Um, what we have here is Justice Stevens sort of getting the last laugh. Um, Lucas made a bright line rule that when there's a permanent deprivation of economic value, I'm sorry, I said it wrong. When there's a 100% diminution in economic value, there's a regulatory taking. Why is it wet here? Ugh. It's gross. Oh. <laughs> uh, I don't even want to know. What? Oh, bless you. Yeah, that's just, just gross. Really. Anyway, Lucas, I think, made clear that when there's a 100% a economic diminution in value, um, there's a taking. Lucas did not put really any significance on the duration on the duration of that regulatory taking. That really wasn't at issue in the, um, in the Lucas case.
But Justice Stevens came back and said, wait a minute, this, this, this moratorium lasted for three years or so, and then it ended, and then they were allowed to build. Therefore, any... <coughs> you okay, Max? Okay, feel better. So therefore, any injury will be temporary in nature, right? Any injury will be temporary. Now, is there a temporary taking, this phrase used before? Justice Stevens says, no. That when the deprivation of value is only temporary, there's no taking. But he added one more point. He said, it's not the case in Tahoe that 100% of value is diminished. Why? Because you still had bundles of uh, sticks in your bundle. You had the right to exclude. You had the right to sell. You could uh, go, as I say, camping and fishing on the land, do different things. You just couldn't build. And also the fact is in Tahoe, it takes years to build anything anyway, so you weren't really losing out. Right, your investment back expectations under Penn Central were not really affected. So the Tahoe Sierra case, again, severely diminished Lucas. Now, what does that mean for all of you? When you're looking at a fact pattern on a regulatory taking, pay very close attention to the duration. All right, pay very close attention to the duration. That if this is something that is arguably temporary in nature, you say under Tahoe Sierra, it's not permanent. We go back to Penn Central. We do balancing. What what were your expectations to build? Did you actually expect to build in two years? No? Okay, you lose. Right? There, again, there's no way in Lake Tahoe you would build a house in those two years anyway. So any sort of uh, a, a dibby is just going to be trivial. It's going to be very small. Everyone with me? Uh, Fernando, I'll come back to you, please. Sure. Kuntz, what was that about? Yep. You have it? Was that one of those like the wetlands, I believe? Okay, keep going. It was the wetlands property, I think. But they, he, it was about the permitting. Okay, so keep going. He had to give up certain property rights. It was giving up property rights, what did the government want? Oh, money. Money. That's what it was. They, had, they wanted him to pay a certain amount of money. Right. And where would that money be spent? Somewhere else unrelated to the flood. Very good. Okay. Um, there, there you go. There it is. Okay. Good, good, good. Uh, again, and I, I don't, you know, the reason why I'm sort of drilling you on these facts, you have to know these ones cold, right? Again, if you're flipping through your outlines, you're never going to finish the darn exam. So you have to, you have to if I just say Koontz, you'd be like, oh, yeah, permitting for money in the wetlands, right? Just It's got to come out natural. And and to the extent that you have any materials with you in the exam, like a one-sentence summary of the case, just like what Fernando just said, that would be helpful. Much more than that you're not going to use. All right, so Kuntz and... Oh, I didn't write Kuntz on the board. I'm sorry. I wrote Kuntz in my own lecture notes. Kuntz and also Nolan and Dolan, right? This is sort of the trio of cases that you have to be familiar with. This is the doctrine known as exactions, E-X-A-C-T-I-O-N-S, exactions. The doctrine is also referred to as unconstitutional conditions. And the theory is this. If you have some government benefit, right, the government can't make you surrender a constitutional right to receive that benefit. And the example I gave in class is, let's say you live in public housing. Can the government come and search your stuff any time you want, give you a random drug test without probable cause? The answer is no. Right, choosing to accept public housing, it's a it's a benefit from the government, of course, benefit on surrendering a constitutional right. That being unconstitutional condition, as is called in the cases. All right, everyone with me. Um, what was Nolan about? Now, no, again, Nolan wasn't in your book. They gave a little, you know, sort of summary about it, but you should still remember. Um, in Nolan, the guy wanted to renovate his beachfront bungalow. And California said, okay, that's nice. We'll give you a permit to build if you dedicate a public easement. Well, that will allow the public to cross your beach, front property to get to the beach. Court said, no, no, no. That easement requires a payment of just compensation, right? The reason why is that the requirement to give the, the, the easement wasn't closely connected enough to renovating a bungalow. That is, it lacked a substantial nexus, uh, a connection, a link, if you will, between the easement to cross the beach and the permit to renovate the bungalow, right? There was enough of a connection. All right. 
So that was the, the substantial nexus test. Then we get a couple years later to Dolan, D-O-L-A-N. Don't confuse them, they're different cases. And in Dolan, a guy wanted to expand a store and pave his parking lot. Uh, and the government said, fine, if you do that, you must dedicate some land in the easement for green space to have, uh, you know, you promise you won't build there, it'll be nice, it'll be green, it'll be for the water, whatever. Right? Um, Again, the court there said, no, 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 that's too much, right? There's not enough proportionality, right? You're asking for this very valuable easement for green space in exchange for what? Paving a parking lot? That's too much, right? So even though the connection between green space and pavement, you don't want water running off, you're asking for way too much. So that's the proportionality part. So Nolan and Dolan say there has to be a substantial nexus and a rough proportionality between the proposal to build and the government's condition, right? The government can't be greedy, to put it maybe simply, right? They can't ask for too much. The request from the government must be related and in the same ballpark as what the person is requesting. And in Nolan and Dolan, those tests were not satisfied. Everyone get Nolan and Dolan. I used to assign them. I actually like those cases. They're actually very good to read, but they took them out of your book, so I don't assign them anymore. Um, yes, Jordan? Confused by the Coons case because the way I read it, I didn't like I couldn't see anywhere where they were really applying Dolan Dolan. Like they said they applied to impact fees, but were they saying that just the fact that you had to improve wetlands like miles away or whatever was that just out of proportion? To yes. Them? Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. And if you read Justice Kagan, just they applied incorrectly, but I'll, I'll defend both the majority and, and the dissent in a moment. Then we get to the Coons case. Kuntz case. Um, in Kuntz, they were asking not for the dedication of an easement. The government was asking for money, specifically to pay off contractors to do re wetland rehabilitation work somewhere miles away in the, in the district. And the court said that's a no-go. What made that holding tricky, though, is there was never actually a taking in that there was no surrender of property rights. There was a surrender of money. So Jordan's question is, how does this fit in with Nolan and Dolan? And the short answer is, not exactly, right? It's really a general unconstitutional condition case where the government said, you can't condition a permit on being forced to surrender your money, right? Because imagine the government said to you, hey, give us a million dollars, please. Not so please, right? It's give us a million dollars. Can the government do that, Jordan? No. Or let's say the government goes to your bank account and takes a million dollars from your bank account. What happens then? What could you seek? Yeah, it's a compensation, right? It's a taking, right? If the government walked to your safe deposit box, took a million dollars in cash and walked away, you could sue the government for a taking. And I think that's basically how the majority viewed it. It was extortion, right? The government said, give us your money. And the government can't just demand money. So why can they demand money in the condition of granting a permit? They viewed this as basically strip extortion. It's not the same as Nolan and Dolan. And Kagan, I think, makes this point effectively in her dissent because no land was actually granted, right? There was never actually a taking. The request came before anything was actually transferred. And in fact, Mr. Kuntz never actually handed over the money. Whereas in Nolan and Dolan, they actually did give over the land, right? In Nolan, he dedicated the easement and saw compensation for it. In Dolan, he dedicated the green space and saw compensation for it. All right. Yes. The, the whole, like I guess it's building what you're just saying, the nexus and the proportionality, that's just so confusing. Like between the demand and the effects, I'm still not getting that. It's like they're demanding the money. Right. So, so, so there's two sides of the equation, right? On the one side, the property owner says, I want to renovate my, my bungalow, right? I want to re renovate my home. And the other side, the government, the government says, okay, we will let you renovate your home if you give us an easement. What is the connection between <coughs> renovating a home and granting an easement? Not much, mm -hmm. right? The, and again, this wasn't in your reading, but I'll just describe it briefly. The government said, well, if you make your bungalow too big, people walking down the street might say, wow, there's a lot of visual separation between me and the beach. I don't want to go to the beach. So we need to have a dedicated walkway to let people go to the beach. Does that sound very persuasive to you? No, it's nuts. It's nonsense, right? And that's what the court said it didn't have enough of a nexus. 
in the in the in the Dolan case, they said, okay, I want to pave my parking lot and make my store bigger. The government said, okay, give us a bike path and and dedicate all the space for greenery. Okay. <clears throat> That seems a little bit overkill, right? You, you have a small paved parking lot and you have to give all of your property rights to build elsewhere, not proportional. That's how the nexus and the proportionality tests are applied. Jordan, I think, made a fair point that Coons isn't really a Nolan Dolan test. It kind of is, but not exactly because money was changing hands and not, no land was actually ever transferred. Does that clear up a little bit? Yeah, so on the flip side of that, there is like a proportionality if like they were building the beach house on top of like an area that they were already using to let people go to, yeah then yeah that would be yeah different. yeah i mean I'll, I'll give you an example of a exaction that works uh this has actually happened in new york city all the time you're building an apartment building uh in, in a nice area say, okay dedicate five percent of the units to affordable housing the courts have upheld those saying there's enough of a connection between what you're building and having the community have access to affordable housing that it works Right. There's, and it's not that big of a it's not that big of a loss. You're making plenty of money. That's an action that works. Randall? Oh, they do everything also. They do everything in Austin, don't they? They try. Austin until it's preempted. I always joke that uh, if the legislature had any wits, they would just disestablish the city of Austin and just make it a federal capital. Basically, it'd be like Washington, D.C. And any legislation also must be approved by the state. Uh, what they should do is have a separate system of courts, an administrative court. So actually, the Travis County courts will get all the government suits. Anyway, sorry, we're in session now, so we can we can we can I, we can think things up. Just just move Austin to Greenwich or something. All right. <laughs> just airlifted to Connecticut. All right. What else? Bring all the tacos and everything else. Uh, all right, what else? All right, so that's Kuntz, Nolan, and Dolan. Let's do the last one, Horn. Uh, I say, what's Horn about? So in this case, the Horn family refused to turn over raises to the government. Uh, they, the government was trying to uh, stabilize prices, and um, the court reasoned that uh, Loretta applied because they it was a uh, they took the property. Uh, and it's pretty much like taking your property. Yeah. So they have to pay just compensation. Good, very good. So Horn wasn't actually a terribly divided case. It was eight to one in some issues, five four in other issues, right? On the eight to one part, they held that the taking clause applies to real property as well as cattle, personal property. That that wasn't very controversial. That actually might have been even nine zero. I don't I think Sodomy would disagree with that entirely. Um the part that they split sharply, though, goes to the point of compensation, right? The government had this sort of elaborate program where the raisins would be sold on this sort of secondary market, and that in some years, not every year, but in some years, most years, in fact, the raisin growers would get a profit from it, a proceed. And the government argued that that itself was the compensation, right? And the court said, no, that doesn't work, right? Um, that well, the fact that there's there's, a, there's like a future interest that might provide compensation is not enough to satisfy the takings clause. There's still a taking. And in this case, the court said whatever the value was of the raises that were assessed, that's the measure of compensation. So it's kind of weird. It's just basically wiped out. They assessed a fine for four hundred thousand dollars, and they said, well, the compensation is four hundred thousand dollars. You're done. Go home. No no money changes hands. And so there's a very sort of weird anticlimactic outcome. Now, uh, Justice Sotomayor in dissent said you guys are reading Loretto wrong. That Loretto requires just throwing every single stick in the bundle. Um, and the majority said that's not what Loretto says, and it didn't get much further. Than that. All right. Everyone killed Horn. All right, that took about, oh my goodness, 40 minutes. Um, if these topics aren't clear, in other words, if you didn't know the answer to all those questions, you should go back and look at your notes. Uh, because, I, again, I always test in this topic, so I'm giving you ample notice. Uh, you need to know these cases cold. Yeah, this lawyer? I saw a hand. Okay. It's just so dark, there's no lamp here. I don't know. I, I'm going to have to just get, get a spotlight or something. Yes? Between Ben Cruel and uh, Lucas, the only difference is the court's looking at the question of the holds. They don't mention the uh, diminishing of the economic values. 
I wouldn't say so simply, but you're in the ballpark. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the question is, what's the denominator? That, that's why Penn Coal went differently. But, but Penn Central basically adopted the Brandeis approach to the denominator, which was very significant. Okay. All right. Um, so let's go on. Any questions on these seven or eight cases? Two, oh, well, I just count. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus, the, yeah, so eight cases, depending on how you count. Uh, plus one, nine. So really, there are nine taking cases you should just understand implicitly. Uh, let's go on to today's material. So you remember, I think Coolander covered this, a case called State v. Shack. Remember that with the right to exclude? And yeah, Jacques v. Steenberg Holmes. Remember this one? The trailer in the snow? Okay, I'm seeing some people shaking heads now. Anyway, I'll, 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 I'll recap it for you if you don't remember it. So I think it's usually the third week of property when I usually teach it. Is the right to exclude. And we say often that the right to exclude is the most essential stick in the bundle. Sounds familiar, right? You've read this. And you have these two cases in your book that are sort of presented back to back. The first case is called Jacques v. Steenberg Home from Wisconsin. And the second case is State versus Shack from where? Yes. No. Yes. California. No, it's not California. It's New Jersey. Yeah, it's the other one, right? Um, New Jersey. And so what were the facts in Jacques? In Jacques, you had a um, company that transported mobile homes. Don't call them trail homes. But mobile homes. And they're on these huge uh, uh, flatbed trucks. You've seen these in the highway. It says wide load, right? These are very hard to move around. And a home has to be delivered in the winter. And in Wisconsin in the winter, there's a lot of snow, in case you didn't know that. Um, the road that connected these two destinations were, was snowed over, and they couldn't drive there. To actually bring the um, uh, trailer along this road, they've had to cut paths. And they're very likely that the trailer could have tipped over, right? And the entire thing would be destroyed. There was another path that was a lot easier. They could have just crossed a farmer's field. They could have brought the trailer exactly where they needed to go. So the trailer company said, hey, can we cross your field to transport our trailer? You know, there's snow. We're not going to damage any crops, right? It'll be fine. No big deal. Farmer said no. Wasn't interested. So at that point, the um, uh, trailer company said, okay, do it anyway. Screw him, right? We don't care what he said. And he was sued for a trespass. And the measure of the trespass damages was actually about a dollar for actual damages. Then the court awarded a substantial punitive award. I can't remember the number, but it was a substantial number. Um, and the idea was we want to punish people and create incentives for people not to trespass. And so I at least I asked my students, like, you know, was this fair, right? Was a was a farm being unreasonable? Right? Was this was this unreasonable to deny entry? Because look, if they had driven on the main road, they could have gotten injured. They could have flipped over the trailer and jackknife. All these things could have happened. So was the farm being selfish, Kelsey? Well, good memory. They had lost very good memory. They had lost land in the past. They were very concerned about trespassing. This was really in their mind. I don't think a five-minute car could have, could have arrived at adverse possession is, but but they they were worried about this. So some students say, well, well, you know what? That's their land, damn it, right? And if they don't want to allow people on their land, that's their right to exclude. And you know, who who are these people to come otherwise? Some people say, this is, this is ridiculous, right? You're awarding punitive damages. There was like five feet of snow. There was no actual damage to the land, just less than tire tracks and snow, which would melt in the spring anyway, right? Why are you awarding such high punitive damages? So I always get sort of a split of opinion on that case. Then the next case in the chapter, which I think you studied, is called State versus Shack. Does this sound familiar? Right. Uh, state versus Shack involved a farm in the lovely state of New Jersey, right? Um, the farm employed a number of migrant workers, what are called seasonal workers in, the, in some of the cases. And these are people, generally immigrants, usually very poor, usually not literate, who uh, uh, travel from farm to farm depending which crops are in season. And their existence is very bad. Uh, they, are, they were squeezed. These very small living habitats, they usually have running water, uh, uh, paid very small wages. Um, it was pretty bad. So there were a number of groups that tried to organize the farmers to join unions. This is in your reading today with, with Cesar Chavez and 
uh, you know, si se puede, yes we can, that, that's where it came from, it wasn't Obama, it was Cesar Chavez, right? Um, it's true, people don't, don't know that always. Oh, you guys were in grade school when Obama was elected, weren't you? Oh boy, I'm old. Um, it's, it's part of the job. Um, that's okay. You know what? Okay. Yes, sir. I, I was I was I was in law school. I think I was a two L or a three L. Um, but anyway, you had a number of aid workers in New Jersey, and they wanted to access the um, some of the workers on the farm. And, and by the way, this was a total setup case, right? They went there with a reporter. They they went there to get arrested, right? This this was designed to create a test case. And they tried to enter on. One of them was a, a, a legal worker who went for legal assistance to a migrant worker. The other was, I think, uh, providing medical care. He had stitches in his hand. Uh, he was trying to remove this, you know, the sutures. Uh, so, you know, very sympathetic case, right? They were there to do good. No one disputes that. And then the, 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 the farmer called the cops on them. The officer said, well, I'm not going to arrest him unless you file a complaint. And the farmer went ahead and filed a complaint. And he accused him of criminal trespass which literally they were, right? They were literally trespassing the, I mean, under the statute. They were. This goes to the New Jersey Supreme Court, and guess what the New Jersey court does? Just, you know, you know what happens, right? They create an exception to the trespass statute, right? They say that under the state constitution, the trespass statute cannot be used to deny these particular aid workers access to the farm, and they have some elaborate New Jersey rationale. The reasons are not very important right now. Uh, they say the right to exclude is not absolute. Right, this right to exclude is important, but in some cases, human values come higher. I'm, I'm grossly summarizing the opinion. So then I ask my students. I say, you know, what do you think of this opinion? Right. Some people say, you know, of course, these poor migrant workers need help. They need people to bring them resources because they they can't leave the farm. They don't have cars. Right. They can't travel. They're not literate. They don't. They don't have. They can't go to a hospital. They don't, they don't have money for the hospital. Right. The only way for people to get services is to have it on their facility where they are living and working. And others can say, yeah, but right to exclude. If the farmer wants to exclude them, they can. And I always sort of do, do a poll. Who voted one way in the trailer case, right? Who voted the other way in the migrant work case? In other words, are you okay excluding the trailer company, but not okay excluding the, um, the, the, migrant, the, the aid workers? And I'm not going to ask all of you because you can read it, but I want to just sort of think about that as a background. Anyone want to opine if you remember the case from the, from the other semester? Safety Shack or Jacques, you see Bercom? Anyone remember them or care? Kelsey? Um, I thought that the right to exclude both of them was reasonable based on um, what jerks <coughs> the uh, employees were in Jacques. Uh huh. And, um, the Supreme Court about the right to exclude migrant workers that the groups who were politically promoted against Trump. Okay. Anyone else want to comment? Okay. Thank you. Right. So, you know, all these cases have been studied in law school case books for decades, right? So in 2021, when uh, Cedar Point was decided, I was like, oh, wow, I guess we'll have to update those cases, right? Because now you have a U.S. Supreme Court case, which comes out exactly opposite of where the New Jersey court came out. And indeed, uh, this is in the note, which I know you all read. In 1970-something, the California Supreme Court upheld the Cedar Point regulation on very similar grounds as the New Jersey Supreme Court. But those were the 70s. And as I say, if you remember the 70s, you weren't there. Actually, it's, it's if you remember the 60s, you weren't there, but I'm happy to, to modify it. And I assure us I was not there. Okay, A's were grand. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're ready to be done with me. I know you're ready to go. Uh, you'll miss me. No, 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 no. I, I'll miss you. No, I do. I actually do miss students. Uh, I, I do. I, I, after this, after this first server, a little bit less. I'm like, oh man, I, when's when's class coming? I have to wait till September, August. Oh, so they'll come back. All right, uh, Brylin, I think you are next, sir. Can you give me the facts in Cedar Point, our case for today? No, Alex, I called on you already. Do you want to go again? Fine, go, go. I would never deprive you. I, I, Brian, Brian, buy, 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 buy my beer later, right? Alex, give me the facts. You obviously want to do it. I'll come to him to follow up. Yeah. Labor unions, they're allowed.
allowed to enter onto a farm. Uh, this is the California regulation has three hours that they're allowed to do it. One hour before they're done working, one hour after they're done working, and an hour for lunch. Correct. Um, the specific dispute. I mean, before they before they start working, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Before they start working, an hour. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the specific dispute happened at a strawberry farm uh, where there are about 500 workers, 400 are. Do they live on the farm? These workers. I, I believe they have a separate structure where they live, but yeah, like basically on the farm. Um, I thought they live off the farm. Am I, am I right on that one? None of them live on the farm. Yeah. yeah that, so, so, I, so that's in some way different than State v. Shack, right? These aren't migrant workers who are really living on the farm. They, 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 they in theory, at least commute from somewhere. I don't know where. Okay. Just, just okay. Good. Yeah. So the, the, the labor unions are apparently, they start some kind of uh, a demonstration. They uh, have bullhorns. They are apparently disturb the operation. And then some of the workers joined in on the protest. What are the organizers trying to do? Uh, I mean, I think they're trying to get people to join their union. Right, and, and they're trying to get people to join their union. And let me, uh, thank you, Alex, very good. And, and perhaps the, the only way that they can, right, the only, there's not like a like a like an annual meeting of migrant workers. You kind of just talk to them, right? These people work for a living. They have a very hard job. And the only way to get to them is to actually see them where they work. So California has a statute that's been in the books for, you know, about 40 years or so. Um, and the regulation says that these organizers are allowed to enter the property at three specific times in the morning, at lunchtime, in the evening, or in the afternoon. Um, and they're allowed to talk and interact with the workers. Uh, they cannot disrupt. And that's actually in the, um, uh, that's actually in the rules. Now, they came out with a bullhorn. Were they disrupting? That's actually not relevant to this case, but they probably were not complying with the rules. Uh, they also have to provide notice in advance, and I'm not sure they provided any notice here. Um, because if they did, they probably would have taken the workers away, or they would have tried to make it harder for them to organize. Um, the farmers didn't like this regulation. So, Brian, Brian, I'll come to you now, if you've got your reprieve from, uh, from, from roll call. Um, what was the remedy? What was the remedy that the farmers actually requested here? What did they actually want? Were they looking for money? No, I don't think they're looking for money. No, what do they want? They want them to stay off their land. How do you get a court to make people stay off your land? What's that Sounds called? Sounds like an injunction. Yes, okay. injunction. Very good. So this is sort of a weird case. And Justice... Um, just as Breyer in his dissent makes his point, I think, well, this is not a usual takings case, right? Usually takings, they want money, right? They want compensation, which is what the takings clause affords. But here, the farmers didn't actually want money. Because you imagine they said, okay, fine. The, the union people coming on their land is a taking. We're going to give you just compensation for value of their entry. How much is that going to be? Probably not very much. And whatever that amount is, they're still having the union people come on the farm, which is what they're trying to stop, right? They're trying to stop the union organizers from coming on their land to help organize their workers. And, and although they might say disrupt their operations, right? So it's sort of a weird case. Um, okay, so the farmers bring the suit. It goes to the lower court. Uh, so Sinclair, let me, let me call on you for a minute if I can, please. Uh, no, I wasn't really seeing. I wasn't asking you, but I appreciate appreciate your response. It's like when I ask my kids, "Do you want to go to sleep?" I'm not really asking them, right? Um, so let me ask you this question, please. Forget you read the opinion, right? I just described these facts. I tell you, the government enacts a law that allows uh, union organizers to come on three hours a day for 120 days, whatever it is. What is the relevant test? In other words, what's the relevant framework? What's the relevant case? that you would use to resolve this fact pattern? Just forget, forget having you read the case, if you didn't read it good, right? Just what, what um, um, thank you. What, what would you, what, what, which of these eight or so cases would you apply to, to resolve this dispute? Yeah, I mean, right off the bat, it sort of sounds like the Coons case. Coons, okay, why? Yeah, just because with the wetlands, they were really concerning a portion of the acres, not all of the acres. Like that's the only part that sounds like it to me. Because they're talking about like 
30 minutes, I mean, 30 days here and there, mm-hmm. and not like taking over the whole time. Okay. All right, Anna, what do you think? What case would you think this, it governs this dispute? Why, okay, that's a good answer. Why do you say Penn Central? It's, it's always a good answer because they, they always want to apply Penn Central. Why would you say Penn Central? Why is it not, let me ask you this question if I can, why is it not Lucas? Why, why would the Lucas test not be governing here? Good. Excellent, right? There's no permanent occupation here. And the government can't argue, I'm uh, sorry, the court can't argue that it is. At most, it's three hours a day for 120 days a year, so three, you know, 360 hours a year, right? That, that's not permanent under any definition. So Lucas and Tausi are out, right? What about Loretto? Would you think Loretto applies here? Um, no, because it's not permanent. It's temporary. It's not for the whole is there an occupation at all here? No. I mean, is there anything installed or drilled on the farm, or like, is there anything fixed on the farm? All right. So we have Loretto doesn't really apply because there's no permanent occupation. We have Lucas does not apply. There's no permanence. So we have someone saying Penn Central. So, Clay, and again, imagine you were the lawyers for the case and you're looking at this case as a fresh on a blank slate. How do you resolve this case? I say Penn Cole. You say Penn Cole? Okay, tell me why. Because they're going on the property and they're, are they going too far? And, 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 but what, what case tells us whether you go too far? Penn Cole. Right, but, but what, what case elaborate on Penn Cole to explain oh, when you go too far? Probably Sierra. Well, before that. Penn uh, Central. So, Clint, under Penn Central, who wins here? The government. Yeah, the government always wins. So, this is like a... No, and I don't mean this to be facetious, but it's true. The government <laughs> always wins. Uh, not always, but just about always. So, you know, if, if you are a, you know, Ninth Circuit judge, right, you can just say Penn Central government win. But even some of the Ninth Circuit judges actually ruled in favor of Cedar Point. They were in dissent. But they ruled. And and let's just be clear why. What does it mean to be permanent? Let's just, just sort of tease this out for a minute. Does this mean that the union organizers are on your property 24-7? Or does it mean the government has created this permanent, or the quasi-easement that allows people to cross, and that's a permanent limitation on your bundle of sticks? Oh. Right, just who I did there, right? So think about it. Going from Lucas to Sierra, Justice Stevens sort of said, okay, permanence, right? He made permanence. And what the Chief Justice did here was, okay, you want to play permanent? Let's play permanent game. What the majority basically argued is that allowing the government to enact this regulation was in effect creating an easement. For the benefit of the union workers, right? Again, an easement can say you can cross during daylight hours. That can be an easement, right? An easement can say you can cross during the summer months when there's the, the weather's nice, right? You can have an easement that's on the books forever that allows you to cross at specific times. So, so again, I, I know you didn't take me for con law. You're, you're lucky, I suppose. But the chief justice was a brilliant lawyer. He still is. He's a really good advocate. And what he did here was he basically, as I perhaps inartfully put it, he basically quietly shifted what it means to be permanent. Right? Permanence does not require a physical insulation 24-7, like in Loretto. Permanence does not require a physical insulation 24-7, like in Loretto. Right? I mean, and here's the money quote. I'll, I'll put it on the screen for you. Um, this is the money quote right here. Right? Oh, it's maybe a little hard to see. He says, whenever regulation results in a physical appropriation of property, a per se taking has occurred. 
and Penn Central has no place. The upshot of this line of precedent is that government authorized invasions of property are physical takings just requiring just compensation. Now notice what he said, invasions. He didn't say permanent, he said invasions. Next sentence. The duration of an appropriation, just like the size of an appropriation in Loretto, bears only the amount of compensation. To begin with, we have held that a physical appropriation is a taking, whether it's permanent or temporary. This is probably the most important sentence in the entire opinion, or, or at least close to it. Right? What is a physical appropriation? Well, seizing raisins, that's a physical appropriation. Um, a permanent moratorium building, that's permanent. Uh, eminent domain, that's permanent. Right? What's a physical appropriation? Here, it was basically taking a stick out of that bundle permanently to make it that forever and ever, until this law is repealed, you are required to give access under these circumstances. It operates no different than an easement. And even though the regulation itself only governs for certain hours of the day, this is itself a, a physical appropriation. Your right to exclude has been diminished. Right? And because there's a physical appropriation, regardless of the duration, there's a taking. So you have to think for yourself now, what is a physical appropriation, right? I won't even try and update your flow chart because it's going to look ugly, right? But think of this for yourself. So what is a physical appropriation, right? Did the government actually remove soil from the property, remove some sort of crop or, or a strawberry? The answer is no. Right? Did the government say you can't build? No. What was physically appropriated was the right to exclude. The stick in your bundle. What you lost was the right to exclude. Now the dissenter comes back and says, there is no appropriation. Nothing actually was taken. In fact, this is what Kagan wrote in Kuntz, right? Breyer says, nothing was actually taken. What is the appropriation? The right to exclude is not a thing that can be appropriated. It's sort of a, a kind of like a, you know, it's a legal construct. It's not a physical thing. But the court says a permanent, I'm sorry, a physical appropriation can be your right to exclude. I'm having a hard time comparing that. Like, yeah. They're all... Yeah. Right. I, again, I, I'm, I'm speaking, you know, in, in candor. I have been teaching this, you know, these cases now for a number of years, right? When I read this opinion, like, wow, what did Roberts do here? Right? I always taught my students physical appropriation means tangible, a raisin, right? A cable on the side of a building, something you can touch with your hands. What the court does here is they expand it. And they say physical appropriation can be the right to exclude the most essential stick in the bundle. So if they permanently take one stick in your bundle, it goes away. Look, this sort of puts Tahoe Sierra in jeopardy because they took away the right to build, that's a stick in the bundle. It was permanent, but the court says duration is not important. Alex. Among, yeah. So I guess my question is, yeah, what, what does that do for all of these other cases? EBD, which doesn't help YOU. Right? Uh, yeah. I don't know. And, and to be frank, law professors freaked out after this case. They, they always they always freak out. After, every June, they freak out. I, I now play it cool. I used to get very panicky in June. Now when the Supreme Court decides the case, I'm like, okay, whatever. I'll, I'll read it. I always read the opinions the day they come out, and that's, that's how I sort of cope with them. And I sort of think about it. Um, but this does seem to suggest the court is, is going there. And look, Roberts wrote um, the, the Coons case, right? He wrote this case as well. He wrote another case called Nick v. Township. He is very, very robust on property rights, and perhaps maybe only after uh, free exercise cases, uh, but he's extremely robust on property rights. Even though he argued Tahoe, he argued Tahoe Sierra. I think I mentioned that. He argued that case. He knows how crappy that case, sorry. He knows how, how problematic that case is. 
he made the argument that won, and he probably doesn't like it because he had a client. All right, I think he regrets that one if he could take that one back, but he was a good lawyer. All right. But but Roberts just sort of says it doesn't matter if it's temporary. And the physical appropriation is the bundle of sticks is diminished. You get that one less stick in your bundle. So to Alex's question, this applies to right to exclude. We don't know how far it goes. Right? We don't know how far it goes. So remember I had in your notes that lovely spreadsheet between uh, the flow chart between permanent physical occupation versus temporary invasions. And Robert says there's no difference between permanent and temporary. I thought there was. I've been teaching this case for many years, and I always thought there was a difference, but now there's not. Robert suggests that even a physical appropriation that's temporary would itself be a taking. Now, what we don't know, though, and, and this is sort of there, is what happens if New York said we will only install the cables for, like, you know, one year. I think Robert would say, well, that's still an appropriation, just a per se taking. The measure of damages might be different, but still an appropriation. Everyone get that point, though. He sort of obliterated the distinction between temporary and permanent. Because Breyer's like, this is only for 360 hours a year. How can you say that's permanent? And Robert says it doesn't matter. All right, so, so you're seeing, I think, in a number of cases in the last couple of years, the court is, how do I put this gently, uh, brushing away precedents they don't like, right? And um, you can do this overtly by ruling them, or you can do it quietly by sort of ignoring them. This is category B. Now, again, they may not like Tahoe Sierra, because Tahoe Sierra added that permanence requirement to, to Lucas. So they're sort of undoing it in, in some ways. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so here's Justice Breyer in dissent. He quotes from Loretto, the entire essence of letter at Loretto is whether it's temporary or permanent, right? That was like the basis of Marshall's opinion, and they sort of just brushed this away. And I think also Roberts is very, this is a rule of thumb, always check citations, right? Especially in the Supreme Court. They don't always cite cases honestly, and I actually check citations, and it's just like, they're not honest citations. All right. Um, Another problem I had with this opinion was how the court sort of conflated regulatory takings with exactions, right? If you notice, he went back and forth between Lucas and Nolan and Dolan. So he kind of did that. Nolan and Dolan are different cases. They're not regulatory takings cases. They're exaction cases. And I think it's problematic when you treat them like that because there's a different test, right? The scrutiny is much greater when the government actually makes a demand for you and whether you've been forced to surrender um, uh, a property right. So all the citations to Nolan and Dolan are, I think, a little bit tricky. Uh, Prune Yard, you didn't read this case, so don't worry about it. All right, that's what I want to talk about from here. All right. Um, then we get actually to what the chief applies. He says, the government here has appropriated a right of access to the grower's property, allowing blah, 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 travel three hours a day. Okay. This is the sentence I want to focus on. The regulation appropriates a right to physically invade the grower's property, to literally take access as regulation provides. This word appropriate does a lot of work here, right? What does appropriate mean? Well, appropriate just means to take. But usually you think to take means there's some physical thing you're taking. And the courts are brushed that aside, that the thing that can be taken is basically a right of access, a bundle, the right to exclude. Okay. All right. All right, enough of this one. Any questions on the majority? Any questions on the majority by the chief? Again, he's a very gifted lawyer, and I, I wish he wouldn't do this, but he does this all the time. We're kind of just like quietly massages the case law and just like wipes away things that, that he doesn't like. It's very frustrating. Even when I like the outcome, I actually like the outcome here. I think it's exactly a right case. But the, the way he got there, I think, is I'm not a fan. So a statement against interest, as they say. All right, let's talk about the... Um, uh, is Kavanaugh's concurrence even in the book? Ignore it. It's stupid. It's just... He asks these, he asks these dumb questions or an argument about um, uh, some case that he's like, oh, we can resolve this narrowly and no one cared. And he wrote a concurrence that... Anyway, so just ignore it. Um, the Briar dissent, though, I think, makes some fair points. 
Um, Breyer explains there's nothing actually being appropriated. It's a regulation, right? Nothing is actually being taken. And even if it is being taken, it's temporary, which you apply the Penn Central balancing test. And given the fact that the farm has all this other revenue from its crops and produce, there's no credible argument that there's actually a requirement to pay compensation under Penn Central. And in fact, the farmers don't even argue they would win under Penn Central. Okay. All right, so questions in the Briar descent. So I know you're thinking right now, like, Josh, how do I, um, how, yeah, thank you, Patty, right? How do I put in a, whole, uh, a cedar point into my outline? And I've been giving this question a lot of thought. I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sure your professor is in the tongue and in con law. Um, I think what I'll say for this much is clear, right? If you have a question in which you have um, a right to exclude issue. You need your pen? You good? Get it for? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, it's your stylus for your thing that you need. Um, if you have a question which involves an access issue, right, involving the right to exclude, I think you have to say that's a, that's an appropriation that requires compensation under bright line rule. Again. If you have an appropriation of a right to access, I think you have to say that this requires compensation. What if I say, one second, Ben, what if I say the government appropriates the right to build and that appropriation lasts for three years? Well, that's basically the fact from Tahoe Sierra. And the court did not overrule Tahoe Sierra. So I think you still apply Tahoe Sierra as a temporary taking, right? In other words, the only thing that I think you can safely apply for my class or even the bar exam for, for, for next year is involving the right to exclude. I think as prudent lawyers, it will be a mistake to sort of go beyond that and definitely not for the examination. So I'll only say that again. <clears throat> if the fact pattern concerns the stick bundle, the, the, the stick in your bundle about the right to exclude, I think you must say that's, a, that's an appropriation. It doesn't matter the duration. It doesn't matter how long it lasts. Um, any other type of appropriation of a, of a bundle in your stick, I don't think the court has gone so far as to say that's a permanent, a per, per se taking. For example, the right to build, right, the right to sell. Those things are not quite like the right to exclude. I think that that's where I'd put it. Maybe you disagree. I'm not sure, but that's where I'd put it. Okay. Questions? Questions on Cedar Point? Questions on anything else? No? Want to go home? Go home. Uh, if you can just do the exit poll on the way to the elevator, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I'll see you in class, not Thursday, but I'll see you in class on Tuesday. You'll see Bree on Saturday. Thank you all so much. Uh, Please come. Don't skip class. I know you want to, but don't do it.